Welcome to the Between Two Wheels podcast, where we talk about all things on and between two wheels. I'm your host, Johnny Roblox, and my co-hosts, Justin and Ken, aren't here, as they are at the Lone Star Rally this weekend, so I'm flying solo with y'all. Uh, this episode is being brought to you by Get Lowered Cycles, your one-stop shop for all things Harley and Harley-related. And on today's episode, I am sitting down with Mr. Law-abiding biker himself, Ryan Erlocker. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. Now, for transparency, we already did this show about, what, four weeks or so ago. However, I had some computer issues, and we all sound like robots with a cold. So, Ryan, thank you for uh, putting up with my amateur ways. Yeah, no worries. No worries at all, man. So, we like to start all of our interviews off with some get-to-know-you questions. So, where are you from? All right, sorry, your your Skype is coming through weird. What's the question? Uh, where are you from? Okay, sorry. Yeah, so uh, uh, I am from the greater Yakima, Washington area, a little suburb just outside of the city limits of Yakima. Okay. In, which is eastern eastern Washington state, If uh, for those that are curious. All right, so that's on the other side of the mountain, correct? Yeah, we're on the dry side of the mountains. Um, we call the west side of the mountains the wet side so the cascades basically split us but basically split the state in two and so we're on the desert side and so kind of get all four seasons here and and uh, we actually get very little rain compared to like seattle and stuff sweet sweet so what got you into riding motorcycles oh well uh i guess uh all the way back from when i was a very uh young boy but I will tell you uh that i didn't actually have motorcycles myself we was we were pretty poor growing up and uh i envied deeply envied uh the guys uh kids that had motorcycles and stuff but with that said at least i was fortunate enough uh you know that i was able to not have my own but at least able to ride against the permission of my parents who did not bless those activities but i would sneak out and sneak around the countryside and so i just kind of grew up mostly um, uh, from a young age, uh, on dirt bikes and got a few injuries, which I couldn't hide from the parents that didn't go well, uh, <laughs> got the old told you so they're dangerous. And, but nonetheless, I always had a fascination with them. And that was my dream. Uh, when I was young as you know, someday I'm going to have my own motorcycles. And then as I got into, um, high school, I was finally, you know, working quite a few hours and, uh, I was, uh, an adult then and uh, over 18 and my parents couldn't say a whole bunch and uh, so uh, I got my first uh, well it was a sports bike uh, back then is, is kind of what I started on as far as the street bikes go okay so what was that first street bike all right so that was a uh, Honda if I'm just trying to remember but it was a Honda VTX is what it was and it was a 250 and uh, uh, my recollection is right. It was like a V twin in that uh, VTX, and uh, yeah, I bought it brand new actually, um, and I rode that around for for quite a while. Okay, so what bikes do you currently ride and own? So currently, uh, I have a few, and when I say I, I mean we, um, Law Biting Biker Media here, um, because we kind of acquire different bikes for different reasons and projects and stuff like that but nonetheless uh right here sitting uh, my main bike is my uh street glide 2014 street glide special um and then uh we've got uh, the 2016 dyna lowrider s and a 2007 soft tail night train and uh the fourth bike in my garage of course is my uh my full-time paying job that's my police law enforcement bike and that's a 2018 electric glide so that's the four sitting here right now <laughs> so uh, the fact that you have a milwaukee eight in the police bike and you're still on the twin cam with the street glide which one do you prefer from a motor perspective boy that is a tough question um you know, I can't really tell you that I would point to one or the other. Um, I still have my 14 Street Glide Special, and I abs and and it's you know it's tuned out. I've just I mean nothing special, but it's got um, 
you know, pipes and, and stage one intake, and it's it's tuned out with the uh, Vance and Heinz Fuel Pack 3 and stuff like that. And that thing, that 103, was a great freaking motor, man, and I love that. So my, um, you know, the police bikes, they don't, a lot of people ask that question, they don't, we don't. I can't tell you that for all agencies, but they keep them pretty stock, and we don't get to tune them out and put pipes and stuff. So honestly, my 14 is just as smooth and fast as my, police which is the 107 milwaukee 8 it's a great motor the milwaukee 8. i have no issues with it i just i tell guys they get asked that question i don't necessarily think it's worth upgrading if you have a 103 high output um i don't think that it's that big a deal to upgrade to the milwaukee 8 but so they're the same basically to me <laughs> <laughs> okay okay so you kind of uh, jumped on it but uh so you are a a peace officer and you are a motor cop police officer correct yeah i am i uh that's my day-to-day -day, uh job go out and ride every day obviously i'm pretty blessed there i mean we work hard to get in those positions and uh so i'm also the the uh, instructor the motorcycle instructor for our particular police unit and uh, so that's kind of what i do every day i work the road and then I do some instructing and stuff like that uh overall i've been in law enforcement uh, a little over 25 years and uh, I've had this position I finally got into the motors unit a little over th oh I think it was about three years ago so uh, it was always uh, something I wanted to do and so I'm pretty blessed to be able to get paid to go <laughs> jump on a 2018 Harley and uh, ride around so so with your agency do you pay for the bike yourself and then they pay for the maintenance or do the does the city or the agency itself own the motorcycle yeah so the agency owns all of our motorcycles including cars and stuff too um that's weird uh and it's not weird it's i get that question because i don't know how it works um you know as far as where you're from locally or even on the east coast but yeah police over here we don't uh, I know that goes on, I think, um, but we don't buy any of our own equipment, all everything when we're hired, aside from your gun, um, but all your, your equipment. So yeah, so uh, does that go on over there? I'm, I'm always curious, does it, that go on over there where police have to buy their own cars? Well, not the cars. I know in North Texas, there's some agencies where the officers choose which motorcycle they want to run based on like the two or three contracts that the city has. And then all the maintenance insurance and everything is handled by the city, but the ownership of the bike is done through the, the peace officer themselves. Wow. Yeah. I learned something new all the time. That's why I always, I have heard that before. I just, it uh, definitely doesn't ha happen over here on the West coast as far as I know. So yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. So yeah, I'm lucky all provided maintenance, the bike uniforms, everything. Yeah. Very, very blessed. So I've always been curious when the weather is not, permissible for standard riding do you guys still go out on your bikes okay that's a great question because i've been working all week and uh i will tell you in my unit um and the guys will tell you that too they i give them a lot of flack for it but um so this week specifically i rode all week and i didn't put my bike away some of the other guys did and i mean i was going into work at a couple mornings at 17 18 degrees mm. um yeah it's cold and then the days some of the days would warm up to just just above freezing today we're lucky it got i had to do a motorcycle escort today uh, on a day off just a little overtime deal but um it warmed up uh, a, a bit uh, in the upper 40s but um so the answer to your question is uh they do uh put them away and uh when i'm forced to put mine away i'm pretty hardcore because i just uh, eat live eat breathe motorcycles um, when it starts getting slick around here, I mean, obviously we use common sense. So once, you know, you wake up in the morning and there's humidity's up because it's pretty dry over here. But mm -hmm. um, it, once the humidity gets up and you, so you start having risk of black ice and, you know, of course, if it snows and all that kind of stuff. So uh, we do put them away and then we uh, just have some traffic cars basically that we jump in. But we all hate it. Um, we all <laughs> hate putting the bikes. Uh, it's miserable, you know. It's funny because I get so used to being you know, in the fresh air and your body acclimates somewhat too. I mean, I gear up pretty heavy too, to, to survive a nine hour day, barely above freezing it, it you know, it takes a toll on you. You got to gear up. Right. Um, but I, when I, I have to get back in a car, it's always just, I feel like 
like lethargic and you, you know <laughs> it's a physical experience in motorcycle you're out in the outdoors you're jumping on it you're kickstanding it you're off and on it and it's just there's so much, i just get so tired in a car so I, I i dread going back to it okay so let's jump into law-abiding biker so what is law-abiding biker all about Oh boy, and I'll I'll start diving into this a little bit, and then feel free to to steer me and cut me off. Um, basically, uh, you know, in a nutshell, to to start it off is basically our mission statement here at Law Abiding Biker Media. Now we've been going on well close to seven years now, but our real mission, and all the guys know what my mission is and they they emulate that mission and that's just we want to help as many bikers as we can worldwide using media here like this to educate entertain and we want to build a trusted online biker community basically uh, that we've been working for years now and the other por portion of that is basically to, to promote and sell trusted motorcycle related products um, online backed with great customer support basically bikers helping bikers is what it's all about and so um, I don't know where you want to go with that. Do we want to go back to the history or the, the you know, well, what we got going on or what? So let's take this back to what was your journey to turn this concept into a business model? So what did that look like, feel like, and what were some of the uh, trials and tribulations that you had going from an idea of building this community to actually spinning it up? turning it into something where you can make money to continue building even more content yeah so this this started um back I, our first episode was march 13th uh, excuse me march 16th 2013 um and you kind of mentioned a little bit so you know nobody starts a podcast um or even podcast to get rich because as you know that's not going to happen okay it's it's got to be a passion project i was injured at that time i had uh, gotten an altercation at work and got a boxer's fracture uh in my hand and so i was kind of laid up and i'd always wanted to start a podcast and i started just looking around and listening and at that time um there was just pretty much junk as far as i was concerned i don't mean that in a bad way it's just that, you know it was new podcasting was pretty new back then and a lot of people didn't have good audio and and stuff like that so i was just like you know i think we can i can do a better job at that had no anticipation that um at that time that it would turn to a business model at all i was just like let's just throw some stuff out here and see how it goes so i released that first podcast um my studio was uh old ipad and a uh I forget blue snowball microphone or something in my daughter's closet for soundproofing. I have some <laughs> old pictures of that because I had nothing, you know, and, and uh, you know how it is. You started one and, and it takes time to get gear and stuff. So it started. Um, and I was just looking at some of the, you know, back then a, a few of the stats, I don't look at them too, too much at all anymore. I'm just too busy. I, I don't care. But back then I was kind of seeing how it was received and we started getting some pretty large numbers and I was like, huh, interesting. Um, Let's keep rolling with this. And uh, so at some point, um, I would probably say uh, to, to your monetization uh, question, uh, I want to say it was like probably, we didn't even start trying to monetize till like 2000. We had done it for a year, year and a half. Besides donations, you know, mm -hmm. we always asked for, we got, you know, little donations here and there, but then that's helpful uh, back then, but still, you know, it wasn't making anything off it. So about a year and a half in, um, I decided, okay, you know, we had started the YouTube uh, channel too, then um, not knowing anything what I was doing uh, at that time. Um, and uh, one of the videos I did, uh, again, just looking at the industry and look at some other YouTube stuff, I was like, man, is this, and, and even YouTube back then was in its more of an infancy. I mean, I'm not, didn't start when it first started, but, but that was new. And that video blew up and I was like, you, I didn't, I was like, you gotta be kidding. I couldn't believe how many views we were getting on that. Like this stuff's really helping people and the comments we we're getting. So at that time I decided, okay, this is becoming a shit ton of work here. And, uh, <laughs> and how do you explain, uh, how do you explain to the wife, uh, you know, I'm spending as much time on my off duty hours as I am, you know, at my paying job, and not that you know and that's a inter it's a interesting subject you know not that the the wife's money hungry it's not like that at all it's just you've got to justify if you're going to have a side business it's just like if you went to paint houses off duty you you can't just do that for what if i told my wife hey i'm going to go for the next 3 years and i'm going to go paint houses for free what do you think of that and i'm going to spend 
14 hours a day painting houses away from you how, how does that how would that go over in any family or household you know yeah. so it's not you know you got to be able to go okay this is the end goal this is you know what i want to do with this we you know i want to retire into it when i retire from law law enforcement and do this um full time and so um with i think and i think most people completely understand that if, if they use that analogy of you don't go work for free and so that's when I really decided, yeah, we've got to find some ways to monetize this. And so um, that's when I started looking into some of the things and, and starting some of the things that we're currently doing. And I don't know where you want to go with that. So for us, when the guys and I, we started talking about this right around the time that Justin crashed into me. And it was weird because at that point, we'd known each other for about a year and Ken and I are both disabled veterans. And I was like, well, I don't need the money from this. It, it kind of sounds like I'm being an ass or something, but I have a well-paying job, but I want to be able to give back to the community. So we came up with the idea of Project Clean Slate. And that was kind of the way we were going to take this. And so I took the podcast and turned it into a nonprofit organization. And, you know, Justin has his YouTube channel. He's one of the biggest Harley YouTubers here in Texas, and he's making money from that. But people ask me all the time, how much money do you make on podcasting? I was like, I'm in the negative. You know, I bought the mixer and the microphones and all this other stuff that comes out of my pocket. So justifying that to my wife is tough. And I'm like, look, if I get to build one motorcycle and give it away to one veteran, that was worth all of the time and the effort and the money that we've put into just getting the podcast itself up and running. So kind of doing that is kind of how we did our start, got our start with it. And we kind of followed the same you know, model. We put two episodes out in one week. One, be the first episode we did, it was completely scripted, and it sucked. It was by far the worst podcast episode we've ever done, and so we quickly launched the second episode, which was we we wrote the show notes for that. And our show notes are crap. It's an outline and this is exactly what we have. So whenever I post our show notes, that's what we are looking at to kind of jog our memory on what topics and stuff we want to read and discuss. And that one we started picking up is about four weeks after we had released both episodes that we got over 200 downloads. I was like, oh, okay, well, that's cool. And now we're seeing, you know, almost a thousand downloads um, every week and a little bit over that. And I'm like, wow, people actually listen to us. <laughs> I know. So it's, it's weird. <laughs> so you have published over 220 podcast episodes. What inspires you for your content? Uh, that's a tough question, but it's changed over time. But honestly um you know like you say podcast is plain work and uh you know just getting ready like you say i mean show notes and research and all that kind of stuff it's plain work so i pretty much um just the same thing that inspires me um for youtube videos and some go hand in hand because we'll do a quick youtube video you know youtube videos have to be very snappy and to the point and you better get the information or people um they're gone. Uh, people are there. Uh, you were at the podcast. We can talk about that same subject for an hour and everybody stays. But if you did that on a podcast, on a video, nobody would stay. Um, it's just, they're completely two different things. So sometimes we'll do that. But um, the, insp the inspirational part for me um, is basically anything that can help. Again, we're just trying to help. I really am. That's how I started it. I love teaching. And in the process of teaching, uh, these bikers, I have to learn a lot because I, I'll be the first to tell you, I do not even close to know everything. Not, I have learned so much because I'm forced to, to learn so much. So I'll have to research these topics or research an issue, uh, with a Harley or something like that. 
And then I have to research it so much, I have to make a video on it and I have to do a podcast on it. So I look for those kind of things that I think, you know, this is going to really be helpful to bikers, um, this particular issue. And then I like following, you know, any big things like I did one on lane splitting, you know, uh, motorcycle industry type stuff that can help people, um, you know, talking about that um, or anything else that's going on in the motorcycle industry, the live wire motorcycle when it came out, you know, and I do some of the new, you know, Hardy 2020 model stuff. I did a video and a podcast on that. And so it can be pretty much anything. I like both. I like helping. And then I like the, um, you know, the, the news and new products and, and stuff like that. So I just follow a ton of stuff and I have more ideas when you're a creator. Um, people don't know that I have more ideas in this head, um, than could last two lifetimes or more. So, um, some of the stuff we just don't get to cause it fades away and we never got to it. And then some stuff's more evergreen, you know, where you can make a video and it's valid today as valid in five years as it is today. So yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just keep my, keep my nose to the ground and ears open and, and, uh, start getting ideas that way. So for me, when I'm out, so I travel a lot for work, you know, Monday through Thursday, I'm typically on the road and you know, when I'm sitting in my hotel room every night, I'm just going through and I have a bunch of different searches already set up and I'll go through and see what's relevant. And with us being more of a Harley esque uh, podcast, I try to look for Harley stuff and cruiser stuff. But I tell you, coming up with content is tough because you ask yourself, who cares when you think of a topic? And it may interest the hell out of you, but your listeners might think it's complete garbage. So I'm, I get it. And there's, there's one show that I've been working on and I've done a bunch of research on, and I'm trying to get in touch with one of these one percenter clubs that will let me interview one of their higher ups. So a president of a chapter or something and talk about just how the millennials are affecting the one percent clubs. Because if you think about it, they're the most hardcore clubs um, if you listen to the media. So you have the millennials who are typically not hardcore. They are more, you know, I don't care about the criminal side. I want that community side. So uh, talking to one of the one percent clubs, I'd like to be able to interview them. But I tell you what, they do not like to talk to people. (laughs) Yeah, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Um, With nearly 400 and actually over 430 YouTube videos uploaded to date, what do you find is more fun for you as a creator, podcasts or videos? Oh, boy, man, the tough questions, the tough, uh, tough questions. Um, You know, I find enjoyment and I'm not going to cop out on the questions. I'm just uh, <laughs> prefacing it. I won't, I'll, I won't, I won't give you an attorney answer. Okay. Um, to me, um, being a creator, uh, and we've had a lot of talks about this in law biting biker media, everybody that kind of surrounds the team here. Um, and Matt, uh, here lurch, they call him who helps me produce, uh, does some of the audio. We've went back and forth with that, but being a creator and coming from, um, growing up, you know, with whatever equipment I could get my hands on, I was always into filmmaking. Um, and, uh, in another life I would be a filmmaker. Uh, I just didn't grow up with opportunities like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, thus I'm a police officer, but respectable, you know, I'm not putting that down at all, but there was nothing back then. We didn't have internet access and all the tutorials that you have now to, so I would say with that said, I like the filmmaking part of it. I love making the YouTube videos too. Um, there's a lot more instant, uh, you know, some instant things and comments and things like that and, and and seeing that, but I love film making and, and that kind of stuff. And YouTube is a lot of that, a lot of it's tutorial stuff and that's great, but you know, I really do it different. Uh, I think than than most other channels, it's pretty, the, the equipment and gear and techniques we use now is just notches above. Um, and we've kind of always did that just to take our channel to the next level. And that's because I have an eye, uh, for that kind of stuff and the aesthetics. Now, if you look back at my old videos, please, uh, you know, I'll only, have, I didn't have a, I didn't have good gear and I've learned a lot. I mean, you know how it is. It's just like, Oh, I leave them up, but I'm like, God, that was horrible. Um, 
But my favorite, favorite part out of everything, which actually is the very, um, I do this completely still for a passion. And in fact, I'm starting tonight after we get off this. It's my first night, always going in November. I start my documentary films. And so um, we have multiple documentary films. Some have been released on YouTube. And I think our Canada one is like at 190,000 views now. Um, that's been out a couple years. And then we have an, um, another one um, from Reno. Anyways, um, that is actually documentary filmmaking is my number one passion. And all this, a lot of what I do supports my passion to make documentary films to entertain bikers and the biker lifestyle and brotherhood and riding and all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to settle in and uh, tonight and start. And it takes me like some of those documentary films. The last one I did for last year, which is still for sale. I do sell them hmm. for a year or over a year and a ton of our community buys those documentary films. And uh, then I'll eventually release them on our YouTube channel as I come out with a new one. But you know, you're looking at, well, just filming it when I'm on those trips, you know, mm -hmm. seven, seven to 10 days of just mad. And I have to carry so much film gear and backpacks and it's, I'm exhausted. And then the edit to edit it properly and tell a story. I'm really into storytelling. Um, that'll, you know, I'll be behind the edit in the edit room, 200 hours probably over the next between now and Christmas. And sometimes I try to get them out before Christmas, but that sorry for the long thing there, but I'm passionate about that. And so that's actually my favorite thing. If I could just do that, it would be awesome. Um, I still like the other stuff, but it helps support um, that uh, portion and, and entertaining through those those documentary films. So that's the long winded answer. Sorry. I, I will say that the one documentary of yours that I did sit the entire time through was the Canada trip. And I loved how you did that one. And I was talking to the guys, I was like, Hey, let's, let's try to do a documentary of one of our big road trips. And it is a lot of work. And no matter how you look at it, you know, Justin probably has three or four cameras. I have three or four cameras. Ken has, well, I think he just sold his only camera. So it'd be two of us really filming and we'd probably have to stick some cameras on other people's helmets and bikes and stuff like that. But the storytelling piece of it is what I liked the most. I don't care for moto vlogs. I, I, I just, I don't care for vlogging in general. I find it to be well, boring and it's the guys who do it for a living god bless them you know i i just can't do it they're they're riding the same streets and nothing's really changing but the the road trips and the the storytelling behind the road trip that's that's just awesome and it really makes me want to go and ride those same rides and the same roads and hit the, up the same towns and everything so that's part of the storytelling piece that i think the audience likes is they're not just hearing about some guys, you know, what his day was like or what his week was like. It's actually, here's what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're doing it, and all the small non-tourist trap places that we're doing it in. So for me, that, that'd be something I'd be interested in trying. In just once, just to see how painful it is to get all of that stuff done and get all the video and editing and all that taken care of. I think it'd be, it'd be fun, but it'd be a, a chore. Um, let's jump over to the law abiding biker store. So back in December, 2017, you guys had a fire at your warehouse or someone's garage. How devastating was that for your business? Yeah, so that was, uh, yeah, December 18th, 2017, and uh, we're just a bootstrap company, you know, coming up, and uh, again, just trying to help bikers, and one of the ways we thought we could do that, and to monetize, because, you know, it takes a lot of, like you say, um, you know, you can get the negative really easy, and uh, we were for a, a long time, just all the equipment in the studio alone, um, but so we were bootstrap, and uh, we started that uh, online store started selling products we believe in and, uh, you know, things we had tested and tried and things like that. Anyways, uh, 
we were at that time, you know, again, being bootstrapped, we couldn't afford a commercial facility to store all this stuff. So we had pretty much taken over the entire garage of Rick uh, Kane, who is uh, my store operations manager still to this day. And uh, we took over his, God bless him, he, he allowed us to take over his entire garage. And uh, so we had a lot of, a lot of product, a lot of product and uh, that we had accumulated over time and trying to build. And then we'd pay and we would dump money. That's one thing, you know, we just keep dumping money back into the business. That's what you have to do to try to grow it. Like you, I have a full-time paying job that I feed my family with, you know, this is definitely a passion project still, um, uh, law abiding biker media here, but, um, yeah, so we didn't have insurance. Uh, and I know that sounds stupid to a lot of people. Yes. Um, it was stupid, but when you're just running and gunning and working two full-time jobs and building a company, you know, we, what's, what do you ever think you're going to have a fire in your buddy's garage, you know? And so that's exactly what happened. Um, uh, luckily, uh, Rick um, was okay. He was asleep and he sleeps in a bedroom adjoining the garage wall. And, uh, you know, he was working graveyard shift. As, he's a full-time police officer too. And luckily he woke up to it and uh, was able to, there was smoke, you know, in the house already. I mean, it could have been really bad smoke inhalation and stuff. And he got out, um, but nonetheless, his bikes were in there too. And our lift and one of our lifts and, and it burnt absolutely to the ground. We lost 100% um, of our uh, inventory from our store. And so we basically had to shut at that time, we had to shut the online store down for a few days and, and gather our thoughts and figure out what the hell we were going to do. So yeah, that was pretty devastating uh, time to, to figure out, you know, what we were going to do with law abiding biker. And it, as far as that goes and whether we were going to keep going with the store actually was a conversation. Mm. So with your products, as we just heard, you actually carry your inventory and you're not drop shipping from the manufacturer or distributor. How does this model help law abiding biker store with like customer service and people who are buying from your store? Yeah, that's a good question. So as long as we can do this, we're going to do it. Um, we've, you know, built back over time and, and been blessed um, uh, with some of our vendors and things like that uh, to, to get back on our feet and keep that store going. But one of the things that I really like, and I want to try to do it as long as I can, I'll be the first to tell you, I don't know as you scale, you know, where that goes. But right now, um, Oh, the first prong to your question, as far as carrying, we do carry a lot of our own, our own inventory and we do have a commercial facility now. Yes, it is insured now. Um, we're, we're able to afford insurance, which is super expensive, but um, that's, that's the nature of the game. And so we, ha we carry a lot of stuff, our regular selling stuff, the stuff we know that moves. Again, I give all the credit to Rick Kane, who is my store operations manager. I don't, it's an hour away from me where he lives and that's where right now the facility is. And so he makes all those decisions. He really makes most of the decisions for the store. I employ him to do that and give him that authority. Um, but, um, we do carry a lot of that stuff. And so that's easy to ship out and y y you get better margins on stuff when you, when you have it, you know, yourself and you ship it out and it's quicker. Um, the second part to that, uh, is uh, we do drop ship some stuff too. We don't have a big enough because, and all online stores do that. You have to because unless you can afford Amazon warehouses where you can store windshields and exhaust systems and you just have unlimited storage room, you can do that. So some of the bigger ticket items that don't sell as often, but we just simply right now don't have the room to store, we will still drop ship um, through, uh, some of those vendors and things like that. Um, and, and it does, you know, drop shipping is a great thing, but it does cost us a lot more to do that with the margins down because a lot of them charge extra to do that. And, you know, uh, you got to kind of do a back and forth kind of deal. There's a little bit more uh, administrative stuff you have to do to keep track of those orders and stuff like that. So definitely if you can stock it, um, uh, that's the best way to go. And then the kind of the third prong part to your question there is, uh, you know, the way our store is different than your, all your big boys online is the big boys. I mean, think about it. And, and I thought about it too, when we started ours, I'm like, do you know anybody? And I'm not talking about, about them. I'm an affiliate. I do affiliate marketing for RevZilla and stuff on some products we don't carry and stuff. Do you know anybody behind RevZilla? Do you know anybody behind JMP Cycles? How about Cycle Gear? Which Cycle Gear, all they are is a conglomerate and they bought up, the way I understand it, they bought up uh, RevZilla recently. You know, you get these big companies. That's normal in every industry. But who do you know 
at those companies? Like, you know, is it even a biker that owns it or is it just a CEO of, you know, some guy? So ours is different where right now it's bikers helping bikers and behind the scenes, it's me, it's Lurch, it's Big Daddy, it's, it's you know, Brian White. Um, they're all bikers. They're all faces of law abiding biker media. They come in and out of videos and they're on the podcast episodes. And so when you email or when you're asking for help, you know, you're talking directly to somebody that eats, breathes and lives motorcycling and, and just absolutely is, is fascinated and passionate you know, about it. And so I think that comes across when you're answering emails like, oh yeah, that's a common problem. When I was riding last year across country, that happened to me. You know, that's a big deal to guys. Like, um, we shut our, we shut our store down each year for about seven days where on the store itself, it says orders are going to be delayed. We are bikers like you and we are actually out on a ride. And so a lot of people still order from us and we just ship it when we come back. Um, so that, and that's what I think, uh, that's why I think a lot of, cause you can get, you know, a lot of stuff at different places online, but, uh, you come to our store and a lot of people do just because they're community members and they love what we do. And they love that we help bikers and, and do so much to try to help bikers via YouTube and the podcast and stuff. So they literally tell us all the time, I came to your store just because of that and purchased from you. And we greatly, greatly appreciate everybody that does that as it helps support us. So you were saying you have a commercial space now. Is it a brick and mortar store that someone can actually come in and shop or is it just the storage space and it's still 100% online sales? It's mostly um, online sales right now, but one of the things to get distributorships, the way it works is in the motorcycle industry is there's only a couple of big dogs as far as middlemen and their warehouses. And you're talking about places like Drag Specialties and Tucker Rocky. They're two big ones. Um, and so when you get, we were before this, we were actually, because we were so noted in the industry, um, vendors reached out directly to us, places like Vance and Hines and Titan lifts and, um, tech mounts. And I could name a whole bunch of others, bug slide and bike, right? They, because normally they go through these big, not all of them, but they, a lot of them go through these big warehouses where they just sell, you know, a million dollars worth of product and they wipe their hands clean. And then the middleman distributes it to people like us. But anyways, getting back on track. Uh, that's kind of how it works. So before that, vendors were actually reaching and breaking their traditional rules of working directly with us, which brings margins up and uh, we don't have to go through the middle, man. So um, because of that, because now we're transitioning into, we got to grow and that's what everybody does in the industry. And if you want to grow your store, you got to get hooked up with with some of these middlemen. So we are doing that now. We still do work direct with a lot of them like Ciro 3 d which is a huge one for us and they've supported us and we've supported them for a long time. Um, but because of that, that, we've now had to do a brick and mortar a little bit because a lot of the middlemen require a brick and mortar, at least for you to be open, you know, where customers can walk in. So there are hours down there now where uh, some customers do stop by and they can come get stuff, you know, directly there if they choose. We don't heavily advertise that at this point, but as we, some of us retire from our law enforcement jobs, some of the guys are closer than me. Um, they will have more of a, a, a you know, a walk-in uh, type facility where people can do that. Still, even with that, in today's day and age, brick and mortar, that's secondary to us. The where where the, your, our audience is online, they're not in that little city where our store is. You know what I mean? Uh, some are there, so we're gonna always maintain that online's our number one deal. And and if the store is open a couple days a week, it's open. So yeah, yeah, we started doing that recently. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and take a break. We go through our um, our giveaway we have coming up. And then when we return, we will dive into the MC world a little bit. Well, for those that don't know, Admin Black is a fan of our show and they are supporting us with our cause to help veterans transition back into civilian life. They hooked us up with a set of color matched stretched saddlebags to raffle off to help us raise money for Project Clean Slate, where we get a Harley, customize the hell out of it, and give it away to a recently separated veteran. Here's the bonus. Since Between Two Wheels is a registered nonprofit organization, you get to write off your donation on your taxes as charitable giving. Head over to BetweenTwoWheels.com, the two is spelled out, T-W-O, and click on the Project Clean Slate link to enter for your chance to win today. All right. So, you were the president of the Blue Knights chapter 
for nearly three years, and now you are the president and founder of the Sworn Few Motorcycle Club. What caused you to start your own MC? Well, we had, uh, uh, like you prefaced there, um, the kind of the first uh, time I got involved with some of that stuff um, was the Blue Knights. And actually, there wasn't a chapter in this area ever before. And so we actually started and brought uh, a Blue Knights chapter uh, into this area, which still exists. And I know all the people there and I know the president and stuff like that. Good, good group of guys. Um, just I learned a lot of things over the time that I was uh, there, president of a Blue Knights chapter. Um, and, uh, you know, and again, I don't want any of this to sound like uh, that I'm putting that club down or anything. That's a wonderful club. They do a ton of wonderful things and uh, a lot of very, very uh, wonderful people involved with that organization. But what I found is I kind of wanted, um, their rules were a little bit different and I just kind of wanted a more tight brotherhood, so to speak. And I wanted to do more riding. Um, I wanted our uh, club to not just, uh, we're not an event, the sworn few MC that I started, um, it's not an event club. So what I mean by that is we don't just like go to events and stand around and go on a, you know, for hogs and dogs at the Hardy dealership on Saturday and walk around and then ride home or just go to lunch. We're all about very, very tight knit brotherhood and riding. I mean, riding like laying down miles. That's what we're all about. And that's what we enjoy uh, doing. And I, that's not real. That wasn't really possible in the environment where we were with the blue Knights. Um, they do do a ton of event type stuff and that's great. And they do raise a lot of, uh, a lot of money, but the other caveat to that, uh, you know, as far as the blue Knights goes is it's not hard to get into the blue Knights as long as you're law enforcement. And, uh, a lot of the people just never showed up to stuff. And so they were kind of just on paper. As long as the people paid their dues, they were technically on a list. And I just wanted something. I'm just the kind of guy. I just wanted something a little bit closer, uh, tight knit. So, um, I decided at that time, um, you know, the, one of the other things is too, and that's their deal. And it's like I said, nothing against it. A lot of other law enforcement clubs do that. And they're not actually hundred percent LE, even though, um, you know, like the blue Knights, for example, they have 10% of their membership anyways, when I was running it are honorary members. And that doesn't, that means they can be from any walk of life. And that's not putting down any other walk of life, um, at all. It's just, if you're going to wear an LE patch, um, kind of, to me, it's like, you know, that, that can come with some responsibility. And so if you're not an Ellie and you're in an Ellie club and you're wearing an Ellie patch, there just can be some conflicts there. I think, um, never experienced any me personally. Um, so those were just a couple of the things why I thought, you know, I'm going to hand this over to some good friends of mine who were in the club and they, they took it over their retired Leo's. They're doing a great job with it. And I started what is now known as the sworn few MC, which is a very much smaller club and um and it, a lot of the values that i wanted uh are implemented within that club and there is a you know it's more traditional you don't just get in there are no honorary members um if you see a sworn few mc le patch that is a 100 percent sworn full-time law enforcement officer or fully retired with a law enforcement commission to carry firearms and stuff like that, even in retirement. So, um, and actually we only have one of those retired guys right now. Everybody else is up and active. So, um, we do have friends of the club, um, but they're not honorary members. They're friends of the club. They do not wear a three piece patch. They do not wear an LE patch. They wear a, a little cookie. Um, and it says friend of the club. So they in no way look like uh, full fledged. Those are just some people that want to ride with us basically and ride long distance with us. And so some of those very close people who um, want to be involved with the club can get involved that way as far as a, we call them friend of the club, not honorary, anything like that. So um, yeah, and that's that club's still going strong. And uh, like I say, that club, uh, our club is all about laying down miles and visiting different cities and meeting as many bikers as we, in our travels. We just love um, both law abiding biker media and the sworn few. We just want to meet as many bikers as we can and shake hands. And it's, that's one of the coolest things, um, about starting law abiding biker media for me, um, is getting to know so many bikers and just meet people all over, you know, the world really. Um, yeah, very, very cool. So m most of the MCs out there are men only, and they have to ride Harleys is the sworn few uh traditional in that sense we are um yes it's males only in this club and uh and uh you have to wear uh or excuse me you have to uh ride an american-made 
a V twin. Okay. Uh, as far as that goes, so yeah, very traditional. Okay. Is it difficult? for an LE motorcycle club to get going in the world of 1% dominant clubs? No, uh, it's not. Not for us at all. Um, we didn't really even think about that at all. Um, we just came up with the idea to start a club, and uh, thus we just started it, and here we are. So we didn't give a lot of thought into that at all. Yeah, I know, I know a lot of LE clubs are kind of given a pass when it comes to that side of the MC world. I know when we were starting a veterans club, we had to jump through a bunch of hoops and deal with the local one percenter group and do the whole coc and united clubs and all that stuff so i wasn't sure if it was more difficult being an le club or if it's the fact that you're all law enforcement that they're not going to really mess with you all so <laughs> yeah correct and i you know and i hear some of that stuff and i'm definitely sensitive to it like what you had to go through and i'm sorry because you're a military veteran of this country and you know you you i mean that should be your right and so I hear things like that. So what I say is, um, although we don't have to, um, as law enforcement, um, uh, we, I just can't be involved with that at all. Um, you know, we take an oath and we're not going to be involved with that world. Uh, we're separate from that world, but I do know that civilian clubs or, you know, even veterans clubs have to go or they don't have to, but again, that's up to each person. And I get it. There's some politics involved there. And so, um, you know, whether you have to go ask your area or, you know, some dominant club, I think the whole thing is unfortunately just, it doesn't make sense to me at all. Um, but I do know that that stuff kind of goes on, but we're very blessed. Yeah. We're law enforcement. We're not going to ask for permission from anybody to, you know, we <laughs> risk our, like you, well, I go out and risk my life every day for anybody whether you like me or not and we're not gonna go play those games or ask for permission we're gonna ride and ride free uh, where we want so yeah it's just a, it is different it is different because we're ellie i think so good questions though what headaches have you had dealing with that side of the biker culture and your day job as a motorcycle cop uh, sorry, his, I'm trying to understand the question a little bit. It cut out a little bit. So, it, so yeah, as as a motorcycle cop, and you're dealing with all walks of life, including some of the one percent clubs that you may have to pull over. Do you have any headaches, or is there any issues that you deal with being a law enforcement officer on a motorcycle who's also in an MC? And you're pulling over other MCs for breaking the law. Any headaches or any stories you can share? Yeah, no, uh, no real headaches. Uh, in fact, uh, just to bring it to light. So this morning I went and I had to do an overtime detail at a Salvation Army toy run. And so these different groups, um, including um, one percenter clubs and other clubs um, in this community where I live, um, they all show up to do this. And it's, you know, or Toys for Tots the weekend before we did uh, YMC. It was the women's shelter, the battered women's shelter. And so our actual police unit here, our motorcycle unit, um, the event organizers, they actually get have to get permits and we escort them because they have these permits. We escorted them like this morning all through town and we have a very specific route and we block intersections for them. So these huge convoys of motorcycles can ride through town, uh, you know, with their toys on the back and then they meet at a location and give all these toys. And uh, we actually give safety briefings at these uh, events. And so I'm not speaking for every community across the United States because I'm telling you what happens here. And we don't have those issues. We we are around um, all different types of motorcycle clubs. They know who we are. I mean, we're a city here. Our county is about 250,000. The city limits of Yakima is about a, a 100,000. I see these people, you know, even other um clubs, you know, uh, up at the dealership. And, uh, I talk to in uniform, talk to them all the time. And so, um, they know who we are. And I think it actually breaks the ice a little bit, you know, when a regular patrol officer maybe st stops some of those people, you know, in a, in a black and white, uh, car, it's already a little bit different when you're stopping them on a black and white Harley Davidson, just because there's that motorcycle, regardless of which 
side you come from, if that makes sense. There's already, there's already a commonality that, you know, when you're out riding in 17 degree weather, you know, and stuff like that, and they see you, you know, it's just, there's a different thing there. It's, it's a, it's a love regardless of which side of the fence you fall on that, that we all have. So I just really don't see any problems again in this area. So. Sure. So do you ever get folks who question your law abiding concept with the stigma of being in an MC? So does anybody question the law abiding biker aspect? Sorry, it's cutting out again. Like, and then me being in a, a law enforcement motorcycle club. Right. Oh no, no, honestly, I haven't really got that over the years. Um, just because being an MC in itself should not be have anything to do with any type of illegal activity. You know, 99% of the bikers, which is what we preach out there on the roads who we meet and who are part of our community and likely yours is just good, hardworking, very giving people. They're law-abiding citizens. And when we say law-abiding biker, um, you know, we're not talking about like, um, you know, oh my God, you, you, everybody speeds now and then geez i got tickets before i was a law enforcement officer for speeding that's not that's just those are civil infractions what we're talking about when we're talking about law-abiding bikers is you're you work you you know for the betterment of society you are you are the 99 percent on the road um i don't care if you go you know at your construction job or you work at a grocery store it really doesn't matter the point is you're not out committing, you know, extortion and running guns and drugs and, and different things like that. Um, just because you, even if you, you know, got a DUI because you made a bad decision and that was 10 years ago and, and you, you got the help you needed and you're back on track. I mean, you're a law abiding biker yeah. to us. That doesn't, we're talking about criminal element. I mean, and that wants to be a criminal that claims to be a criminal and you know, that's not a law abiding biker. Um, so that term can get confused a little bit, but no. And, and because it's a LE club and because we don't play any of those games. In fact, you know, um, you know, as a law enforcement officer, we have very strict background checks and, um, those things are, are checked on and there's very strict policies about you know associating with known felons mm -hmm. and y y so we we don't cross that line um, we all respect our jobs and the rules that we have to work on so um, they're just two completely separate worlds and uh, so yeah yeah it's a good question but no, we don't get anybody asking us anything about it really okay so my last question before we go into the anti shade tree surgeon questions is what is the biker revolution all about so we talked about it just a little bit there um and that basically is what it is the biker revolution hashtag which i always say and i mention it be part of the biker revolution you know we have our membership side here and a private facebook group and all kinds of stuff um basically we're just trying to bring as many bikers as we can together in those communities and there's a ton going on just bikers setting up rides and, and all kinds of stuff but for so long um I saw before I started uh, Law Abiding Biker Media, a lot of attention, unfortunately, Hollywood, because it, it it was sexy. I don't think it is as much as it used to be, but it was sexy for a while there um, for Hollywood to always make movies on just like they do, uh, you know, about the mafia and stuff, right? It sells, it sells commercials, but they were always focused on, again, the, you know, the, the 1% portion of of the biker community when in reality uh you know and so a lot of people saw that and you know regular citizens and so they would get scared when they would see it's not that much anymore and i think it's because of things like you're doing and i'm doing to educate the public and being out there like i was today and you know talking to kids and you know and that kind of stuff um I really just wanted to take the focus off that very small portion of the biker community and bring the attention on the law abiding biker community. In fact, the 99 percenters, us, we're the ones that actually control the entire motorcycle industry. We're the ones buying stuff at all these online stores. We're the ones, you know, setting up rides and in, in communities and shaking hands and not standing off when I pull up, you know, in the middle of nowhere, like I will did last year and this year, you know, and seeing another biker, we, we go up and talk to them and shake their hands. I want to know where they're from. I want to know their background, you know, and uh, that's one of the greatest parts. And so that's the actual biker community. And that's what I call 
the biker revolution is it's it's time for us just to say hey we're the actual ones that that are out there we're the ones and let's let's uh you know be friendly to each other let's meet each other let's start these communities let's ride together let's get online like now skype and skype each other and talk biker stuff it's just with the technology we have it's just amazing so that's really in a nutshell what i mean but when i say the biker revolution okay so the reason we call these the anti-shade tree questions and i came up with the three questions and we asked him when we were interviewing him and he just crapped all over them so now we have to ask them every time. So uh, it's three questions. If money was not a concern, what motorcycle would you own? Okay. So if money wasn't a concern, I, I would buy that. Uh, uh, I, I was at one rally and I can't remember where, where I think it was Rosalia outside of Spokane, Washington, but Jay Leno, uh, the Jay Leno jet bike. And um, I would love to have that thing. <laughs> And I think it was, I forget what kind of jet motor, but they started that thing up. It was a totally unreasonable bike, um, but how badass would that be to have? And then the only caveat to that is, is I would want to be able to be authorized to ride it on duty and actually chase people down and stop them on a jet bike. How badass would that be? <laughs> now, I do know that years ago, a company, like a small little boutique company created a turbine motorcycle. And because it wasn't production, it didn't get any records for the fastest production motorcycle, but it would go into the, I think the 300 mile per hour range. I'll, I'll have to go back and find it and I'll update the, uh, the listeners. But yeah, there was a turbine bike, which if people don't know, turbines are what they use in, in jet engines. So that's, that's pretty cool. Where would be your dream ride? So if you could ride anywhere on earth, where would that be? So before I was um, uh, able to go to Hawaii, I might've said Hawaii, but I've got to ride twice, once in Oahu and once in Maui this last year. So I'm so blessed there. I got to take my daughter around, but I guess right now it would be, mm, I have to say, Okay, it's either Scotland or Ireland, one of the two, but let's just say Ireland. I think that would be really cool to ride around Ireland. Ireland is an awesome place to ride. So You get to ride there? I did. So I lived in England oh. for two years-ish, and I did a couple of day trips, just put the bike on the, uh, the little floating boat and go over, and then I had a girlfriend in Dublin, so her and I would just hop on the bike and go. Uh, I like the area around Limerick and County Cork. Both of those are awesome, just scenic. But it does get boring because you can pretty much ride the entire country of Ireland in like two weeks. So <laughs> Yeah, right. I think it would be a one. Yeah, you're right. And I know uh, we have some members over there and uh, you're right that I think just as a ride there once or twice and say you yeah. did it. But yeah, I can see how that would be the same with Hawaii, honestly. Yeah. Um, you know, even the t few times I've ridden around Hawaii, it's so beautiful. But if I lived there, I'd be like, OK, I'm out of roads. Yeah. And uh, where am I going to go now? You know, I would still figure it out and do it. But um yeah, I bet that's so, you're so lucky. Oh, I bet that's just gorgeous, just gorgeous country to, to at least get to experience. So good for you, yeah, man. I, good for you. I uh, I did a 30-day trip around Europe and just hopped on the bike, getting couch surfed and rode, you know, I had, you know, I put the bike on the train and took it off at the first stop in France and just rode all the way down through Spain, Portugal, France, Italy, up and through the Balkans and just cruised for 30 days. And that, that was my bucket list ride. And now I have to go do it again because my wife is, she wants to go ride in Europe. So after I was like, okay, we'll just rent a bike, we'll rent a couple bikes and we'll just go cruise. But like the Swiss Alps are amazing and just cruising through Switzerland, Austria, you know, just seeing the biker culture in Europe versus what we have here. It's, it's so amazing to see the differences and as well as seeing the commonalities of other places. So yeah, definitely. What is one piece of gear 
that you never leave home without? Yeah, that's an easy one um, because we already talked about a little bit, but um, heated gear. So uh, even when we go on our long trips, uh, you know, cross cross country, multi-state like we do every year, that's the one thing, even when we leave in the summer and uh, we left this year and I'll tell you one day uh, we went to the North Rim of the Grand Canyon but we came out of Jackson Hole one morning and it was, it doesn't matter, it was June. It still was down near freezing. Um, even in June, just it was a cold, cold, wet morning. And uh, so, and up being a riding in 17 degrees as a police motorcycle officer, I'll tell you my heated vest liner. And I've got three different kinds depending on whether I'm on my police motorcycle or my personal motorcycle, heated vest liner. There so, you go. what brand of heated gear do you prefer? Um, so, on my police bike, just because I have to wear gear and a bulletproof vest, you really have to get those heat heated gear liners underneath your bulletproof vest, if that makes sense, because you wouldn't feel it. So um, I have to wear a really thin one. And the one I fell in love with um, is uh, from Mobile Warming. And it looks like a little halter top, for lack of a better term. It's really just a little thin. It has two batteries. But the thing I like about it is it's not bulky and it sucks into my body underneath my bulletproof vest, and it keeps me super warm. Now, on my personal bike, um, when I'm riding, I got, uh, uh, what is it? It's, uh, God, I have it on my website, but uh, um, it's it's gerbing. Basically, it's a gerbing, and it's a heated vest liner, and uh, it's more, you could wear it, and people wouldn't really know it was a heated. It's pretty uh, stylish, but it's got the sleeves cut off it, but it's basically, uh, I just can't remember the exact name of it, but it's it, it, it's a product from Gerbing and it's battery. And then the uh, backup I have, because battery is great, but batteries fail and they don't always, you know, uh, hold their charge that long. I have um, first gear heated vest liner that plugs into my personal bike. That's the one that never leaves my saddlebag. So I'm never left without it and I can always plug it in and it never needs to be charged. So that, that one's from first gear heated gear. So do you also have like the heated gloves and everything or is it just the vest liner? Just the vest liner. Um, what I found, I used to have the heat. I still do somewhere sitting on one of my shelves, the heated socks and heated gloves and heated pants that go with the first gear. But what I found is, you know, on my personal bike, I have a heated seat and heated grips. And so with those heated grips and that heated seat and a heated vest liner, you're really warming up uh, your bloodstream. You know, it's going into your hands, it's going into your rear. And with that, you know, it keeps your core really warm. So, and I, you know, running a fairing bike, if I wasn't running a, back when I bought all that stuff, I was, had my 05 street glide with apes on it and no fairing, no windshield. And so it was taking a lot of wind, but with a fairing bike, I don't feel like you really need the gloves and uh, the socks and all that. And, you know, and all, and the pants and all that kind of stuff. So that, that keeps me pretty toasty. Now I don't have, I have heated grips on my police bike, but I don't have a heated seat. But even in those 17, 18 degree days with heated grips and a heated vest liner, and layered multiple layers of course b- besides that um uh you know it was tolerable i'll say it's still very freaking cold <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> makes me think about what i'm doing but uh yeah yeah i got through it all right well ryan we do appreciate you coming back on the show and and again dealing with uh us having poor recording i'm i know for a fact we're good this time so uh do appreciate it and you know, we'd look forward to maybe having you come down to Texas and do some riding. We might join up with you. Absolutely. I would anytime, like I said, that's what we're all about. I would love, um, uh, to, uh, meet you guys at some point. And I would love to just talking about riding in Ireland, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Definitely. Uh, when I retire at some point from the day job, I will be able to expand a little bit more but we can definitely reach texas because we were there not this last year but the year before we uh, actually stayed one night in amarillo and stuff so it's not out of reach um, and i would love to meet you guys in person and uh doing great with your podcast and stuff so good job thank you for tuning in to between two wheels podcast to see the show notes for this and all of our episodes to find links to our social media and patreon page where we are raising money for project clean slate head over to our website at www.betweentwowheels.com the two is spelled out T-W-O on behalf of Justin, Uncle Ken, I am Johnny Roblox saying be yourself unless you're a jerk then be someone better peace I, 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 I like, I like this.